uh, we'll get the program going. Um, my name is Bob Barker, and I'm with the AGC of Wisconsin. I want to welcome everybody to today's program. Um, we're pleased to have Anthony Huey with us. Anthony is the uh, owner, president, um, founder of Reputation Management Associates, and a regular pre presenter on the AGC of America circuit, um, really involved in construction industry with contractors, and um, we're just very pleased for him to talk about the crisis communications issue today, which um, we all need to be prepared for. Um, we don't like crises, right? But um, they happen. And uh, so I just want to welcome everybody today. And Anthony, I think I'll just let you take it from here. How's that? Perfect. Thanks, Bob. Good afternoon. For those that don't know me, my name is Anthony Huey, and I am here to answer your burning question, who is this guy and how is he somehow qualified to talk to me about talking to other people, especially in a crisis situation like we're in the middle of now? Well, let me tell you, I've spent my entire career on both sides of what I call the news media game. First as a news reporter and an editor where I basically dug up dirt. I dug up information on companies and organizations like yours in order to get a better news story. But I got out of the business of writing news and now I run a company called Reputation Management. And I do three things in life. The first thing that I do is I help organizations communicate in the good times. So I do a lot of marketing, I do a lot of message development, I do a lot of PR. So when you're trying to generate a little story about some construction project you got going on, I help you be a little bit more successful placing that on TV or the local newspaper. Second thing that I do is the exact opposite of that. So when one of your senior managers gets arrested for dealing meth out of the trunk of his car, or you have an accident on the job site or something bad happens, I help you survive that day of, Armageddon. So I do a lot of crisis consulting and a lot of crisis training. Then the third thing that I do, which is about half of what I do, what I'm going to be talking about next Tuesday, is I help people like yourselves more effectively communicate, whether it's in person in a job trailer in the desk, talking to an owner, doing a, a toolbox talk in the field, when you're interviewing for the $150 million project downtown, or when it's virtual presentations, which was what we're gonna talk about in my session next Tuesday, is when you have to stand in front of a camera, a Zoom meeting, a, a Microsoft Teams or whatever, I'm gonna teach you how to be a little bit more successful and connect connect with the people you're trying to do. It's interesting. I do this, well, at least before COVID knocked, knocked me out of the air. I haven't been on an airplane for about three months. I used to do this live about 120 times a year all over the world. About half the people I would do the training for and the speaking to were CEOs and presidents of companies. And a lot of the times when I walk in the room, I was greeted by these guys and gals with these blank looks on their face like that guy's guy right now. What do you mean, Anthony? I know how to communicate. <clears throat> I'm a smart man. I have a Harvard MBA. When I have to go in to deal with the media or talk to an owner in a crisis, I do what I always do is I just go in there and I wing it because I'm just so smart. Well, you are going to learn today and next week in particular that any time that you're communicating and you wing it, bad things are going to happen. My mantra my philosophy in life that really involves everything that I teach is the phrase perception is truth. Perception is reality. What the people perceive is what the people believe. And I argue with people about this all the time, but I'm here to tell you it's true. Think about this. Let's go back to 2016. After the 2016 presidential election, I read a Gallup poll uh, that asked Americans why, why they voted for one of the two presidential candidates, why they voted for Hillary, or why they voted for Donald Trump. And sure, you had the people on the left that voted for Hillary, and of course, the people on the right that voted for Donald Trump. But the vast majority of Americans, your number one reason why you voted for one of those two people was simply, I don't know, I just liked Hillary better than Donald Trump. Well, I like Trump better than Hillary. What the heck does that mean? I mean, think about it. Where did everybody on this call get your information about the candidates in the last election? Where are you getting your information about the candidates in this election? I mean, think about it, Brian. Did you get your notepad out and you flew up to 
Seattle where Hillary was giving a speech and you took notes on her plan to deal with North Korea. And then uh, uh, Donovan, you got your notepad out and you flew down to Phoenix where, where Trump was holding a rally. You put your little red hat on and took notes about his plan to deal with Obamacare. And then on November 9th, 2016, you all pulled your notepads out. Hmm decided where to, who to vote for, where did you get 99.9% .9 of your information about one of those two people? From the news media. And here's the problem and why I'm here today. In our society today, whether you're talking about COVID-19, social unrest, an accident on the job site or whatever, it is the news media shaping that larger perception. All of the things or most of the things that we perceive about our world is through the lens of that camera or the pen of that reporter. So there's an incident that happened a couple years ago. The oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico blew up. Remember the BP rig, the Deepwater Horizon rig? It happened on a Tuesday morning. I called my wife and I said, hey, honey, we're going to have some fun tonight. We're going to watch TV news for an hour and a half and take notes. There was silence on the phone. Truly, that night, I went home, I got my notepad out, and I turned on Fox News. And for half an hour, I was taking notes about what Fox was talking about that explosion. Then I flipped it over to MSNBC for half an hour took notes, then over to CNN. At the end of that hour and a half, I looked at my notepad. I was shocked. Three completely different news stories. And I said to myself, how can that be? The facts are all the same, right? The thing blew up. But see, who was Fox News talking to? The oil men down there in Louisiana talking about how this is going to affect supply and business type things. And who was MSNBC, the anti-Fox, talking to? the Sierra Club and talking about all the poor ducks that are going to have oil on their head, CNN, something else. So my point to you is if you watch nothing but Fox News, you will only get what? One side of the story. Same with MSNBC and so on. A little bit more about me. I'm originally from Ohio. Uh, I grew up in Dayton, Ohio. I went to the Ohio State University, sorry, about five years ago, we're living in Columbus. And after the 23rd straight day of below zero weather, not below freezing, below zero weather, my wife said to me, why are we living here? And I said, well, honey, because my business is here. And she says, but you're on the road every week. And I said, good point. So I said, all right, honey, if we're going to move south, we're going to go all the way. So we moved to a place called Sarasota, Florida. So I live on the west coast of Florida now. And a couple of years ago, I was so excited because it was my first hurricane. So as a Midwesterner like you, I have no idea what to expect. We're used to tornadoes and flooding. We've got these shutters on our windows. We batten down the hatches. The hurricane hits on a Sunday night. The next morning, we nervously wake up throw back the shutters, look around, Whew, a lot of yard debris, but no damage whatsoever. We dodged a bullet on that one. So that night I'm watching CNN and Anderson Cooper's doing a live shot from a place called Bradenton, Florida, which is five miles from my house. And behind Anderson is this massive tree that had been ripped out of the ground. I guess it was a trailer or something that had been shredded into a thousand pieces of metal. There were baby diapers and clothes all over the scene. Now you're sitting in Milwaukee, you're sitting in Sacramento, you're sitting in San Antonio, you're sitting in New York City and you're watching that. What is your perception of what happened to the West Coast of Florida? Devastation, right? I looked at my wife, I said, huh? We got in the car, we drove out there. It was the only damage within 50 square miles and Anderson Cooper found it. So in our society today, if you think about it, it's the media shaping that perception. Don't believe me? Let's go back three months. So it was my last job before the shutdown. It was the week that they shut down basketball where everything went to hell. Uh, I was in Las Vegas speaking at the AGC's national convention. I'm on my way home. I'm reading the newspaper and I read a survey that was done, I think by Pew or somebody that had interviewed uh, 18,000 registered voters or something like that. And of these people that they interviewed, the question was about how concerned are you 
about COVID-19, about the coronavirus. Now, this was at the time, I believe, there was 68 deaths in total in the United States. That's incredible. Think about that. Three months ago, only 68 people had died. So at that point, they said, how concerned are you about the coronavirus? 78% of registered Democrats said they were extremely concerned and they did not think that the worst, they thought that the worst was yet to come. That's 78% of registered Democrats said that. 40% of registered Republicans said the same thing. Now that made me scratch my head. I said, that's kind of weird because we as humans in America, we are not fundamentally different. We do not have different DNA if you're a Democrat or Republican. So why do most of the people, almost very high number of people think that we're not even close to being the worst yet? And then, the, then less, way less than 50% think it's not that big of a deal. And then it dawned on me, it's where we get our information. You see at the time, if you watch nothing but Fox News, what were you hearing? Fox was downplaying the coronavirus at the time. They were saying it's going to be over. Trump was saying it's going to be over in, in, uh, in a few weeks. It's not that big of a deal. On the other side, if you're watching nothing but CNN or MSNBC, the world was about to end. See, they're on the extremes. And I'm not playing politics here. I don't care where you are politically. But if you're watching Fox News, you're only getting one side of the story. If you're watching MSNBC, you were only getting one side of the story. So my sermon to you today as we continue to deal with the coronavirus, as we continue to deal with the social unrest in this country, and as we have election looming, that you really need to pay attention to where you're getting your information. Because if you're only watching one of the news sources, you're not getting the whole picture and you're doing yourself, your community, and this country a disservice. So again, I don't care if you're right or left, you can't watch just Fox, you can't just watch MSNBC or CNN, you got to watch them all and then use what's in between your ears. That's how I watch TV at my family or watch the news in my family. I turn on Fox News. When they start to repeat the news, which is about to after 10 minutes, it's the same stuff all day long, I switch it over to CNN. I watch it until they start to repeat the same stuff, which is about seven minutes. And then I switch it over to MSNBC. And then I switch it over to BBC. And then I rinse and repeat until I have what is a pretty good idea of what's going on in the world. And somewhere in there, is the truth. So think about that. So in our society, it's the news media shaping that perception. Well, how does this apply to you locally on your job site or at your company? Well, if you have an accident on the job site, if something bad happens, if you have to, if 10 of your workers develop COVID-19, you have to shut the job site down. How you communicate in a negative event affects how people perceive you. And it's not just the media. It's communications, it's perception. So what we're gonna do today in my short amount of time, I I've taken about three days of crisis communications, training, tools, tips, tactics, and I boiled it down to about 55 minutes, but I wanna give you things that your company and you as individual construction staffers need to think about if something bad happens. What's the name of my company? The name of my company is reputation management. What does that mean? Reputation management means three things. Reputation management means protecting your company's hard-earned reputation before you have a crisis. There is a number of things that you, both at the corporate level and the site level, need to be doing now in order to prepare when you're hit with COVID-19 or whatever it may be. You cannot wait until your crisis to figure things out. I cannot tell you in March, how many companies in the industry called me? Uh, hey, Anthony, it's been about a year since I talked to you. Hey, quick question. Do you have a pandemic response plan? Uh, do you have messages that I can give to our employees on how they should, what they should do about COVID-19? By then, it was oftentimes too late. So you can't wait to come up with all these things. So that's one of the major concepts we're going to talk about today is all these things that your organization needs to do now to prepare for the next crisis, all right? So that's what to do before. Second part of reputation management is protecting your reputation in the middle of your crisis. How you communicate, certainly to the media, but there's a whole lot of other people you need to talk to. How you communicate to employees, how you're gonna talk to uh, the owner, how you're gonna talk to subs. Very important that you're talking to these people and not just focusing on one thing. So how you communicate in the middle of you blew up, blew up the job site really affects your perception. And we'll talk more about that in our next uh, hour together. 
Third part of reputation management is mitigating the damage that comes after your crisis. Now, having worked with literally, truly, dozens and dozens and dozens of you in crisis where you've blown the job side up, those organizations that do a good job on the first two, preparing for and communicating in the middle of their crisis, have a far easier job mitigating the damage. So we're gonna spend most of our time today on what to do before and some things to think about in the middle. We'll kind of tie this all together with, with what's been going on. Got to get it into your head. The most important time frame in a crisis, when we're going to look at what those types of crises are, is the first stage of the crisis, the first really day of a crisis. That's when all the bad things, the misinformation, the rumors, and things get out there. So my entire mission today is to help you hit the ground running as quickly as you can so you can act and do all the things that you need, you need to do. All right, so let's start with what to do before. I've got five things that you should think about organizationally, both I guess at corporate and at the job site, that you need to have in place now. Do not wait until your crisis. Number one, biggest takeaway of my entire session, really the greatest thing I can leave with you in life, is your organization both at the corporate level and site level, must have in place before a crisis, a crisis communications action plan. You need to have a document that you open up instantly when something bad happens, and it tells you who is going to communicate to whom, when, how, and all that process needs to be spelled out now. If you find yourself in the middle of a crisis having a meeting to figure out what to do, it's bad. So you need to have this in place, and I'm going to go through what should be in your plan, and I urge you, please, I beg you, do what I say. Get some sort of plan in place, whether I help you or not, or, or the association gives you some guidance, you need to come up with a plan. So you need to have a document that spells out what you do. Now, good plans are about that thick. Waste of time plans are about that thick. So if somebody wants to write you a plan, a crisis plan that's that thick, it's a complete waste of their time and your money. And by the way, I would go back and on that bookshelf that you have all your binders and see if you got an old school crisis plan that got dust on it and it's about that thick. Now, the plans that I write, which of course are good, are in essence about, I don't know, 20 pages in length. The very first page, which is on an app now, but if follow me here, the very first page is an organizational chart made up of roles that somebody at your company needs to play in a crisis. And I've got four non-negotiable, mandatory, must-have roles that somebody, I don't care who it is, I'll give you guidance on it, must be filling in a negative event. The first is the I call the crisis communications team leader. This is somebody, typically an executive with authority, that is the facilitator of the crisis communications team that allows you to for, to, to make sure you're doing everything that you need to do. They need to have the authority to make quick decisions and facilitate the communication. So team leader, first person on the list, it's usually somebody of an executive level. Let's call time out and go back a little bit. Really where you should start is developing or putting in place a crisis communications team. So I got to ask you right now, all these people on the call, there's about 50 of you, if you had an accident right now, if something bad happens, what would happen? What team would be called into place? Do you have that figured out? Who's on that team? Certainly you're gonna have executive management, but there's a lot of other people, right? You're gonna have, um, you're gonna have HR, you're gonna have safety people, you're gonna have maybe finance people. You need to know now who's gonna be on that team. Don't wait until the middle of your crisis. So I urge you to go back and put that crisis team together. So get that together. All right, so number one, you got that box, that first role is the team leader. Second person that you need to have somebody play this role is somebody who's in charge of all external communications. So all information going outside the company walls, this person is responsible for. So this would include writing messaging, writing by time statements, prepping spokespeople, coordinating media calls, all the information going out 
is somebody playing that role. Now, typically at companies, this is a marketing person or a communications person. I know the people on the call, you got a diversity of, of company size. Some of you are big, some of you are small. I don't care how big or how many resources, you got to have somebody doing that role. Somebody that's in charge of writing, distributing news releases, liaising with the media. It's third person on my list. Someone's got to play this role. Is somebody at the company that's in charge of all what? Internal communications, taking those messages that the external person is and distributing it to your employees, sending a representative to the hospital if you have deaths or injuries. Communicating to your employees is extremely important in a crisis. There's this new thing, I don't know if you heard of it, called social media. What do you think your employees are doing in a crisis? They're Instagramming, they're Facebook posting, they're tweeting. If you are not telling your employees the same stuff that you're telling the media, you're in big trouble. Perfect example, one of my clients is a road builder here in Florida. Last year, they tragically had an accident on the job site. So a, a, a worker was clipped by a car, sadly was killed instantly. The site superintendent on that project instantly picked up his phone, texted his wife, my God, Martha, pray for Bob. He was just killed on the job site. So superintendent sends that text. Immediately, his wife gets on Facebook. Our hearts and prayers go out to Bob. He was just killed. Everyone be thinking of his family and Mary as we go through this difficult time. Well, the gentleman who was killed, his wife, found out that he had died on Facebook. You never want to allow that to happen. That's why you have somebody that's in charge of communicating to all your internal audiences, mostly your employees, letting them know what's going on so they're consistent in messaging. Next on my list, number four on my list, somebody's got to play this role, is that I call it an operational manager. So this is the person who is the connector between the crisis communications team, which typically involves, you know, the president of the company, the SVPs, the safety people, and the field. They're communicating back and forth, finding out what's going on, gathering information, talking to first responders, so and helping bring that information back to the team so they can formulate their communication. So those are the four, team leader, someone in charge of all external communications, someone in charge of all internal communications, and an operational liaison. Now you can have helpers, but you gotta find somebody to play those roles. Now, the rest of the plan, which is not that big, the rest of the plan, each box has a couple few pages of step-by-step, -step, granular level action plans or action steps that tells that role exactly what they need to do in a crisis. So let's say I'm the external guy. Uh, we have a crisis, I open up my plan, I go to my little section, it says step one, report to the crisis communications command center located in the Badgers conference room. If our building is inaccessible, report to the Holiday Inn down the road, our backup location. Number two, step two, write two to three key messages as to the details of the crisis. Number three, take those messages, write a news release. Don't know how to write a news release? See page 17 of the plan. Number four, take that news release that you just wrote and send it to the media listed on page 13 of the plan. See what I'm doing? So it's a step-by-step -step exactly what I need to do. If you don't have something in place like that, you're in trouble. Most people that don't, don't have that granular level, that have that big binder, it takes them three hours to figure out what to do and by then it's too late. Most of the misinformation, most of the problems are caused in the early stages of your crisis. And if you are not correcting misinformation, bad things happen. Another Florida example. You may remember, it's a big deal about two years ago, Florida International University, they put in a bridge, a, 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 a prefab bridge, put it in the university, they installed it the next day, poof, flattened some students like a pancake, they were killed instantly. So the, that happened in the morning. So the shot at the new news was, it was all over the Miami Herald, all over the TV stations in Miami that then got picked up nationally. So if you turned on the news in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that day at noon, NBC was reporting that this bridge had collapsed. Now the shot on TV or the headline on TV was, local contractor flees scene of fatal accident. Local contractor flees the scene of fatal accident. So what happened is somebody, somebody on the street had one of these. 
Everyone's got one of these now. And they shot video of the construction company moving a guy, a, one of their workers moving a big crane or be, big piece of equipment down the street. It turned the corner and it disappeared from frame, the frame. So somebody, we don't know who said that they were fleeing the scene. Well, come to find out in reality, the first responders had asked the contractor to move the equipment out of the way so they could get the first, the fire trucks and stuff in. So that was on the news, right? And it was misinformation. Uh, they didn't lie about it. Just somebody heard, they heard it. It was, a, it was a rumor. The problem was nobody from the company called to correct that information. So to this day, if you were to Google it, all these stories pop up that that contractor flee the scene when that, that is not true. And they just went bankrupt, by the way. And, and I don't want to scare everybody, but especially if you're a company president or a leader, 30 years of hard work destroyed in 30 seconds if you mismanage your crisis. And that company in Miami did exactly that. They mismanaged it. They didn't communicate effectively. They went bankrupt and they're out of business. So some things to think about. So you got the plan. You got to have that granular level action plan. I urge you to go and do that. So that's number one biggest takeaway. Next on my list, things to think about before. Update your plan. I do, I'm working with a different GCCM subcontractor every week. I help them with positive communications and I do a lot of crisis consulting. And a lot of you, and I'm sure it's the same with the people on this call, you've got these old binders that are that, are that thick and you got dust on them and you haven't looked at them for 20 years. That is a huge mistake. So when you do finally get your plan done, you need to update it. I did work for a, I think it was a chemical company. They wafted styrene, it smells like airplane glue, over their community at four in the morning. They had a release. They had to evacuate 7,500 people that live around this plant to the local high school or YMCA. So I got a call seven in the morning. I show up at the plant. The very first question I asked the president of the company, the first question I always ask is, hey, Bob, you got a crisis plan. And he said, well, <laughs> of course, Anthony, hold on, let me go get it. So this guy goes in this back closet, banging all around. And he comes back about five minutes later, he hands me a big thick binder and I literally did this and blew a quarter inch of dust off of it. And I said, well, this is gonna be interesting. So I opened it up and I found where their, their spokesperson was. And I said, all right, it says that uh, Bill Belichick's your, your, uh, your spokesperson. Yeah, where's Bill? Yeah, Bill left the company seven years ago. Oh, okay, all right, it says Alice Jones is your backup. Where, where, where's Alice? Yeah, she's been gone for four years. So my point is, even you have this plan, if you haven't updated it, things have changed. Technology has changed. If you were, if you were engaging in crisis communications principles from even five years ago, you're way out of date. There's this new thing called social media. If you don't have ways to control social media, how to engage with people on social media, your plan's outdated. So second takeaway, please go back. If you got a plan, update it. If you don't have a plan, get one. Next on my list, brainstorm weird. Brainstorm weird, what does that mean? Well, let's brainstorm normal. Uh, a normal crisis in the industry is pretty obvious, right? Job site accident. You know, you have a, a, a worker injured, they fall down the elevator shaft, you have somebody get electrocuted. Um, other typical issues in the industry, product quality issues, you pour a bunch of concrete, three months later, you start seeing cracks in it. Uh, those are typical crises and you all should know what those are. Google's a great thing to see what's going on in the country, other parts of the world with, with, in the industry, know what they are, but I'm also asking you to brainstorm weird. What does that mean? So one of my clients, couple examples. One of my clients is a large national restaurant chain headquartered in Columbus, Ohio. It's not Wendy's. I can't tell you who it is. Now, when they think crises, what do they think? Food poisoning, right? Maybe finger in the chili kind of a thing. Somebody gets shot in one of their restaurants. Well, a few years ago, everybody woke up one morning in Columbus, picked up the daily newspaper, front page across the fold, and I'll paraphrase, Senior vice president of blank restaurants arrested for deal growing pot in his basement. Now, is that a crisis for that company? Absolutely. Did it have anything to do with food? No. Now, it, just because it's not apparent doesn't mean that it's going to happen, but you should just be prepared to deal with it. Another example, one of my clients is a G GC in the Southeast. And I, this, the president told me the story. I had to chuckle, but it really wasn't funny. Uh, the guy gets home. Uh, he's working late, sits down, grabs a beer, turns on the 10 o'clock news. The first news story was, at, was set at a local motel on the side of some sketchy road outside his town. 
there was police lights going all over the place. In the shot was a, a work truck. On that work truck was his company's logo. Next to that logo was one of his superintendents, Spread Eagle, being arrested wearing nothing but electric blue lady panties. He was part of a sting, a prostitution string, uh, sting, and now his company, his, that worker was, now this guy's company was splattered all over the airwaves that night. Now, was that on that guy's radar? No, but you should be thinking if we have personnel issues, if something bad happens, how would we deal with it? I'm not saying that you have a plan, a specific plan for every potential weird thing that could happen. All I'm saying is part of crisis preparation, get your team together once or twice a year over pizza and say, what are some weird things that can happen? Uh, you know, think labor relations issues, think uh, uh, natural disasters. Uh, maybe you have the thousand year flood um, or an or a earthquake. I mean, you're in Wisconsin. I don't think there's a fault line there, but maybe you've got a freak thing that you never knew about. How would you handle it? If you get together, at least talk about it. You're that much prepared to deal with it. All right, so that's brainstorm weird. Next on my list, I call it taking it to the nth degree. Have you heard that phrase before? The nth degree. Basically, what this means is the more you can do now, the better you're going to be when you actually blow something up. Get things prepared now, buy time statements. If there's any attorneys or corporate counsel on the call or, or executive leaders of companies, there's a lot of things that you can do right now and get counsel to approve now. So you don't have to wait for that to happen in a crisis. A buy time statement, we don't really have time to get into today. A buy time statement is a really a meaningless statement that sounds good that that superintendent or foreman can deliver on the job site to buy you some time in order for the executive team to figure out how they're going to communicate. Those words, and I write them all the time, attorneys can look at it and say, okay, I'm cool with that. Let's change this, blah, blah, bam, it's done. Now, you're instantly authorized to give that by time statement. My point is you can't wait till the middle of your crisis. Do it now. No reason not to. Have fact sheets on the company. Have you thought about a dark website? What's a dark website? In public relations, crisis communications, a dark website is an area of your public facing website that is not, not live, that is waiting in the wings for you to activate in a crisis to provide top level information to the public and just as importantly, the news media. About 30% of what I do is crisis consulting. So when something bad happens in the world all day long, I'm watching the news, I'm on the internet. So a few years ago in April in Boston, what happened at the marathon? Bombing, right? So all day long, I was watching foxnews.com, CNN, doing the whole thing. I noticed within one hour or less than one hour of that bomb exploding in Boston, that the Boston Athletic Association, the organization that plans and hosts the marathon, had a completely different website up that had information for the families of the runners on where they were evacuated to because they got them out of there, right? They had information on street closures, events that had been canceled. Now, if you were to ask your IT guy or IT department, if you have one, to create a website in an hour, would that be possible? You all laugh at me, right? So this is something that you get done now. It's just an area that's a, maybe another page, maybe it's a little microsite that in a crisis, you can put information. There's, there's this other new technology, it's pretty cool. I don't think it's hit Wisconsin yet. You should look into it, it's called Google. Do you think, what do you think happens in a crisis? So you have an incident on the job site, that reporter's coming out from Milwaukee or Green Bay or wherever it is, and the first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna Google you. And what's probably gonna come up first? Your company website. Wouldn't it be fantastic if when that reporter hits that link, goes to your website, staring him in the face, accurate information, that will significantly reduce the chance that you're going to have misinformation out there. And by the way, I should have said that in the beginning. There's nothing that I can teach any of you or any of my clients to guarantee your success. All I can do is give you strategies, techniques, tools that will significantly increase the chance that you're gonna minimize the impact or your reputation in a crisis. So by having that staring at the reporter's face when he or she goes to the website, it's gonna minimize the misinformation. But you gotta have it done now. Things to think about. Next on my list, number five, things to think about now. Drill your plan. So once you finally get that plan done, you're committing to me, Anthony, I promise you I'm gonna go get my plan done. Once you get it done, 
I want you to go through the motions of pulling the thing out and testing it. And my advice to you is to not do your drills like a lot of these PR firms out there do them. So here's what they'll do. They'll, they'll come in, they'll have a scenario written and they'll say, uh, all right, Chris, all right, here's your scenario. So, uh, so Chris Berg will say, all right, guys, looks like we're in a crisis. Let's do a tabletop exercise. Everyone get, get around the table. All right, let's pull up the plan. All right. First thing we need to do is uh, we need to write a, uh, a buy time statement or a news release. Hey, uh, uh, Donovan, go write a buy time statement. Have you done it? Okay, good. Check. All right, let's see what's next. Uh, second thing we need to do is we need to go hold a news interview. Uh, let's see, Brian, go, go do a news interview. Have you done it? Okay, check. The whole thing's over in a half an hour. No, 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 no. You got to have Donovan go into another room and he's got to open up Microsoft Word and he's got start, has to start writing a news release based on the information that you know at that current time. You got to have Brian go into another room, pull, uh, pull up a camera and practice doing a news interview because here's the reality of life. Donovan, Donovan, this guy's got a PhD in journalism, but he cannot write his way out of a brown paper bag under stress. Brian, look at this guy. He looks like a news anchor, but when he gets in front of a camera, he crumples the ground and cries like a little baby. You will discover who within your organization can handle the stress of a crisis. And maybe, just maybe, you need to reallocate. I got to tell you, I've worked with some senior, senior leaders, C-suite at Fortune 100 companies that I was super impressed with. They were kind of like, I looked up to them, very articulate, very well organized, completely crumple under stress. So you need to know who has that ability. That's why, you know, I allow, you might remember, I keep telling Florida stories, but you remember the, I guess Florida, everything bad happens. That's why. I, if you remember last year, it was, or the year before the shooting uh, at Parkland, and Donald Trump said that, you know, he, he criticized the police, like he should, he would have run into the building and saved all those kids. I kind of laughed at that, not because I'm, you know, of anything that Trump does, but you just can't predict how you're going to react in a crisis situation until you go through a live fire drill. That's why fire departments, police departments, if any of you are volunteers or used to be in the, in, in the field, you know that you do live fire exercises to, to try to simulate as much as possible what it's gonna be like, which brings me to my second point on why you wanna do a drill, is you will un uncover the minutia. It, it, it is the little things that will sink you in a crisis situation. I facilitated a drill for uh, one of my clients, they're a chemical company. They have a plant, I think in Cleveland, it was in Cleveland, their corporate headquarters were in Chicago. So the way this went down is I sent my colleague to Cleveland to actually run the drill there. So his job was to pull the fire alarm. They would evacuate uh, all 150 people from the manufacturing facility. The protocol in their plan was to then call the corporate office in Chicago where I was in the lobby hiding behind a plant. And then the corporate office would help them communicate, talk to the media and all that. So it's two o'clock. My buddy texts me. He's like, all right, we just pulled the fire alarm. I'm in the lobby. I don't want anyone to know that this drill's happening. Any minute now, I'm expecting the CEO to run out of his office. We're in crisis. We're in crisis. It's 2.15. 15 minutes later, nothing. Silence. It's 2.20. Nothing. It's 2.30. Nothing. Finally, at 2.35, 35 minutes after they pulled the fire alarm, I walk down the hall. I knock on the CEO's door. I'm like, hey, buddy, you're in crisis. He's like, what? So he gets everyone together. We, we're in this big conference uh, room on the 30th floor downtown Chicago with this big oak table. And on the table is a triangular polycon phone, you know, those speaker phones. And the president of the company pushes the button to connect with the plant in Cleveland. There is a seven second delay between the plant in Cleveland and the 13 people, corporate officers sitting in that room. Can you imagine trying to communicate with a seven second delay? Everyone was talking over one another. They wanted to share their information on their Microsoft OneDrive or whatever, so people know what's going on in the different locations. Well, somebody in the plan didn't capitalize one of the password letters and they could not access the share drive. Now, Imagine if that was real life. It took 40 minutes to get the team assembled. It took 20 minutes to figure out the phone system. They never figured out the OneDrive because the IT guy was sick that day. It was a debacle. So by doing these drills, you will discover 
it's the little things that give you heartburn. I participated in a drill for a GC in Alaska. So they're headquartered in Anchorage and they have field offices all over the great state of Alaska, Juneau, Ketchikan, Fairbanks, all over. My job in this drill was to sit in, by my pool. I think I had a beer next to me because it was after five and call all the field offices pretending like I was a news reporter to see what happens. So I'm sitting there, I'm like, all right, let's call Fairbanks. <clears throat> Hi, my name's Anthony Huey. I'm a reporter with the ABC local. Hello? Hello? She hung up on me. So what's going on? I called her back. So this woman answers again and she goes nuts. So she starts dropping the F-bomb. I don't know why you're calling me. That's 500 miles away. I got a similar reaction from the other field offices. That company did not know how to route incoming media calls to the appropriate person. That's how bad things happen very difficult to manage things if you don't have all the tools in place. So once you go through that drill, your plan's as good as it's gonna get, make the corrections, and then you're as good as you're gonna go. And then anytime that you have even a minor incident, dust off that plan, test it out, that's the only way you're gonna get better. Okay, so that's some, those some things to think about. It's 30,000 feet things to think about. In my longer training, we really get into the nuts and the bolts, but that should be enough at least to get you started. So you gotta have a plan, make sure you're updating that plan, Get your team together, organize that team, brainstorm weird. What are some weird things that could happen to you? Uh, take it to the nth degree, prepare by time statements, prepare uh, news releases in advance of the templates, that dark website is a clue, and then drill your plan. All right, so that's what to do before. Now Armageddon hits, COVID-19 comes in, they shut all the job sites down, you have an accident on the job site, you have a sexual harassment lawsuit uh, filed, you have a data breach, something bad happens. What do you do? Now, truly, we could talk for a week on this. I'm going to do this all in about 10 minutes. So I've got some things to think about in the middle of your crisis. One, make sure that you know who is going to be communicating in that crisis. Is it corporate? Is it the job site level? Is it the owner? So in pre-con, when you get the project and you're going through pre-con or whatever, you need to have a discussion with the owner. If we have a situation, a media situation or something bad happens, how are we gonna run the communications? I, I've seen far too often the, hos the, the, the CEO of a hospital you know, in, in Madison that's being built, it's a very big project, and then the construction company starts trying to talk to, and then they start saying things that are, that are the opposite of one another. So have that discussion in pre-construction, who is going to communicate, what's your, what's your system, you know, we got a system I'm going to tell you about before we leave here that will help you do that. But owner coordination is very important. Who's talking to the media? If you are head, let's say you're headquartered in with in in with uh, 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 Milwaukee. If you're headquartered in Milwaukee or whatever, and you have an accident that's 10 minutes away from your corporate office, I'm not really worried because you can get corporate officers, corporate people that have been trained to deal with the media that know how to give by time statements. You can accomplish that in a satisfactory amount of time. If you were, if your headquartered uh, is in Milwaukee and you're working upstate, that's that's several hours away from your corporate office. You need to really consider who on that job is going to be a communicator. I need to have somebody at the job site that can at least give a buy time statement to the media that will allow you to get the, get the time to get somebody up there wherever it may be. So name your spokespeople who are gonna talk to the owner, who's gonna talk to the subs, the union. I mean, there's a lot of people you need to talk to. You need to figure out who those people are now so you can then do it then. Next on my list, this is for all the attorneys on, on the, on the uh, call, my favorite people. There are two words that you are never ever allowed to utter to the member of the media. What are those two words? No comment. When you say no comment or any form of no comment, 65% of the American people think you're what? Lying, guilty, hiding something. I mean, think about it. When you hear no comment on the news, what do you think? Now, am I telling you to spill your guts? Absolutely not. If something's in court, if it's a personnel issue, if it's under investigation, it's, if it's proprietary, you can't talk about it, right? So how about this? As you know, Bob, this issue is currently under investigation, so I hope you would agree it would be improper to talk about it at this particular time. Now, what did I just say? 
no comment. This is where the light bulbs go off in the attorney's heads because they always want you to say no comment because corporate counsel and your law firm is trying to protect you in a court of law. Where am I trying to protect you? In the court of what? Public opinion. So you may win the lawsuit, which is great, but if you, if everyone hates you and you never get any more projects, you're out of business in six months. So there's this balance. I've never met in my life, in my career, I've been doing this for over 20 years, an attorney that once I've explained my philosophy doesn't say, yeah, I get it. You're not saying, you're not saying to say anything. You're just saying you can't use the words no and comment next to each other because the perception is guilt or lying. And after all, perception is what? Truth, reality. So there's other ways to say no comment learn what they are. Next on my list, deal with your crisis head on. Do not hide out. You must as quickly as you can be down there at the literal curb or proverbial curb communicating. Now, what I'm going to tell you is going to scare the heck out of you, but it's the reality of where we are in 2020. You need to be down there at the curb communicating to everybody, the news media, employees, owners, union, subcontractors, all those people, you need to be communicating within 30 to 45 minutes of your job site blowing up. If you are not down there communicating, bad things are going to happen. You are going to find that you are not going to be happy with what is out in the public. Remember, if you are not saying something, other people will say it for you. To this day, so a lot, of, especially a lot of old school guys, people that are, you know, hate the media, which I, you know, I'm not a big fan of the media either. I think they're disgusting. That's a whole nother speech. But if people have this adversarial point of view when it comes to the media. Anthony, why would I want to deal with that reporter? I hate that guy. I hate the media. Fake news, fake news, fake news. He's just going to screw me. So my response to that is, I hear you. But if you don't do the news interview, if you are not talking what percent chance do you have of getting anything positive in the news story? Zero, right? If you don't talk, somebody will, and they will say things that you don't want them to say. I mean, think of, let's say I'm a reporter. I'm driving home. It's Milwaukee, I'm in Milwaukee or Madison, whatever. I'm, I'm, uh, it's 4.30. I just covered the mayor's groundbreaking on some new hospital or whatever, and I'm rushing back to the studio to edit my my, my uh, story and my phone rings and it's my producer. And he says, Anthony, there's been a fire at uh, the ABC construction site. We need you to go check it out. So turn the car around. I show up to your job site. There's workers all there. There's police all there. Who do you think the first people I want to talk to are? You, because I, but more than likely you as the a person that, that, that where this has happened, you know more about the situation. Now, if you are not standing there ready to talk to me or tell me when you're going to talk to me or give me some sort of buy time statement, what am I going to do? And am I going to say, damn, all right, I guess we go back to the studio and just walk away. No, who am I going to talk to? I'm going to find anybody that I can and put a mic in their face. I'm going to talk to the neighbor who witnessed the accident. I'm going to talk to the Fire to the fire chief, who, by the way, is running for city council next year and has an agenda again, and he's anti-business. I'm going to talk to one of your employees who are walking around the parking lot like the walking dead. And all of those people will say things that you don't want them to say. So do yourself a favor and deal with your crisis head on. How do you do that? I already told you, you have a plan. If you have to have a meeting to figure out what we're going to do, there's no way in heck, man, you're going to be able to be down there communicating to all those people within 30 to 45 minutes. So again, I hate to keep beating it, beating it over and over your head. You've got to have that plan in place. I urge you to do that. Be the first class in history to do what I'm telling you. Truly, I did work for a university. I, I did a whole day crisis communication session for the president of the college, for all the admin, the deans, and all of that. At the end of my six hours, as they normally do, they're all drinking my Kool-Aid. Oh, yeah, this is great. Yeah, plan. Yeah, we got all of our techniques down. This is great. So it's six months later, I, I was working somewhere and I, I, I spoke in the morning. I checked my, my voicemail and there were seven messages on my phone from the president of this college. Anthony, where are you? I've been trying to get a hold of you. So I call her back. She's like, Anthony, I desperately need your help. I said, what's going on? She says, there's protesters outside my office calling for my resignation. And I said, okay, um, 
Well, you did what I said, right? You got your plan done, so you probably have already, you know, issued the statement and 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 talked to all your employees. Well, <laughs> I mean, it was the summer and budgets, and you know, we didn't know how to do it, and blah, blah, blah. And I was quite blunt with her. I said, you know what? I can give you some guidance, but I have a feeling what you should have done should have already happen. So come to find out. So this was around noon. Uh, come to find out, protesters were at her office last night. And the media showed up at about eight in the morning and the shot at, on the new news was this. It was the camera going up to a, a, this woman's office and there was plate glass doors and the shot on TV all day long was the secretary. Well, by the way, the door was locked. So the, the, the reporter tried to open it and it was locked. And then they shot through the glass and the secretary was doing this. And they were ducking down. That's what's ha that 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 would happen. Now I'm all blurry. So that's what happens when you're not prepared. So you've got to make sure that you have those tools in place. You respond quickly. Get that plan done so you're able to do that. All right. Finally, on my list, gather information. The more information that you have in the middle of your crisis, the the easier it's going to be to put out rumors and to communicate effectively. And I've got a few people that I want you to send out to gather information and bring back to the crisis communications team. Quickly, one, I wanna have somebody at the scene of the crisis reporting back to you, the crisis team, letting you know what's going on. This doesn't have to be somebody who's a rocket scientist. This could be a, a foreman or somebody just, police are here, EPA's here, OSHA just left, let you know what's going on. Second person, try to get them to, uh, have them assigned to the highest ranking public official on scene, somebody, the police chief, the fire chief, OSHA investigator, you'll pick up a lot of information. Knowledge is power, information is power. A lot of times things will get picked up at that little command center, things to think about. Third person, if you have, an, if you have a death or an injury, send somebody to the hospital. Two reasons, one, I think it's the right thing to do to handhold member, uh, family members' hands, but they're also there to gather information. I know there's HIPAA laws by just having somebody in the waiting room, they're gonna know stuff. And then finally, I want somebody monitoring both traditional and social media. How can you correct misinformation if you don't know it exists? So that construction company in Miami where that guy was fleeing the scene, maybe they didn't even know that was on the news because no one was watching it. So you got to gather all that information. So again, that's 30,000 feet concepts. You got to make sure you're dealing with it. You can't say no comment, name who's going to be talking to different people and gathering information. All right, so I've hit you with a lot. I mean, I've truly taken days of content and boiled it down to what I think is the best things for you to take back and start doing. Now, I got something that's pretty cool I want to talk to you a little bit about because I got, I told you about that woman, the, 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 the president of the college. I got so tired of my clients drinking my Kool-Aid and then not doing what I told them. And I figured it out, really. It's because they didn't know where to start. Me, it's obvious. I'm a communications person. I'm doing this every day every day in and out, you're building buildings. So what I've done is about two years ago, I took all the things that I teach that I just told you and a whole lot more and put them into one place. And I created this product called Crisis Driver, which is an, an Apple and an Android mobile application that's paired with a web-based admin portal that allows your team to notify your team as quickly as possible. It's got a place for documents. It's got a place for all contacts that you may need to get hold of. And it's most importantly, it has my crisis plan. So I got my, you, you don't have a plan, you can have mine. I give it to you, you can customize it. I'm very proud. I just put together a partnership with the AGC. And I'm very proud that next week, along with Bob and Jeff, we're going to be launching this to the AGC of Wisconsin and to all, all of its members. You get member discounting on it. Uh, you get uh, a lot of tools that are industry specific. I've got buy time statements for different scenarios that I've written that you can feel free to use, throw them out, chuck them out, do whatever. So look for information in, in the next week. It's a great tool. Again, you don't have to use it, but it's really, it's a, a crisis communications program in a box, everything that you possibly need. Well, that's my time for today. So we got a little time left. Uh, just wondering, do we have any specific questions, anything you want to know, anything I could go deeper in or that I did not cover? So for all of those on the call, um, there's a chat feature at the bottom of your screen that you can uh, put your question in from there. Or um, if you have questions afterwards that you think about, just email me at bob.barker at hecwi.org. I'll give them to Anthony um, and we'll get back to you. But um, if you have any questions, you can use that chat feature right now. And I, while you're doing that, if there are, if there are any questions, 
one takeaway is to go back and do something. My, one of my favorite sayings now is if you do nothing, nothing happens. So maybe an action item would be to go, if you're the decision maker at the company, I want you to schedule an hour call with who you think should be on the crisis team. And I want you to talk about what we just talked about. Are you truly prepared? Do we know, do we have the tools in place? Do we have the plan in place? Do we know how the owner is gonna communicate if we have a crisis? If you're not the decision maker, I, I urge you to go back and share this information with the people who make those decisions. I believe, and Bob and Jeff, you can weigh in on this, but I believe we're recording the session, right? So maybe we can make it available for a little bit for people that weren't able to uh, attend because I don't care what you do. I just want you to do something and whatever I can do, Bob can do and the association can do to make that happen. You know, we want to help protect the industry because it really helps everybody. And then I'll leave you with, Another phrase that I use to scare the heck out of the people is by the time you hear the thunder, it's too late to build the ark. Don't wait until it starts to rain. You need to have that ark built now. Don't wait for the next COVID-19. There will be another one. I mean, my gosh, we never even thought about social unrest. One of my clients is a, is a GC in Houston. They had a call last week with the, with the mayor's department. Every GC construction company in downtown had to remove all the bricks, all the, uh, the sheetrock from their job site, things that could be used in protests or to harm other people. It's these little things that you're not even thinking about that could pop up just like that. Let's be prepared. Yeah, Anthony, just to confirm for everyone, we are recording this session, so. Perfect. Yeah. Anthony, we do have one question here just came up. Um, it says, any advice in dealing with OSHA and with an OSHA inspector that shows up? Well, you know, a, a lot of that's out of my scope. That's more operational. My expertise is communication. What I can say is when I do longer training, we really get into uh, messaging techniques and, and Q&A techniques. One thing I would say is that if you have an issue and an inspector's coming out, you need to think about what is your agenda. By agenda, what do I want that inspector to, to, to remember at the end of the inspection or the end of our discussion? What is the perception that I want that inspector to have? Just by thinking about that in advance, maybe bullet pointing it out, writing it out, it's really gonna help you focus as you're walking around, that person's walking around, they're asking you questions or doing whatever you can. You really gotta think about that because they're only gonna remember a finite amount of time, but they're gonna, re they're gonna have a perception of you. That can be controlled with a little bit of effort. That's, a, that's really beyond our scope today, but really thinking about what you might want them to take away from whatever that may be is, would be important. That's what I would say. I know in, in addition to that, I know our, our safety professionals here would say to pick up the phone and call them as well, uh, call AGC. That's what we're here There for. you go. If you would have told me that in advance, I would have said that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good point. I, the, the association's there to serve as a resource. And, and that's why I'm so excited to be a, a partner with them. You know, you can't, not everyone can have access to everything. And by being a member of an association like AGC, it really does a lot of the heavy lifting for you. And that's why they're there. That's why you pay those dues and, and the value. Very important now that we're all kind of fumble around with how we, we, we survive this uncertain time. Great, any other questions? Well, if not, we appreciate everyone joining us today and um, we can follow up with Anthony's contact information and I encourage you to sign up for next Tuesday's program. And you can do that on our website. Um, if you have any questions, just give us a call here at the office. Thanks, Bob. I'm really looking forward to ne next Tuesday. It's one of my favorite things to do. A few small tips will really take you to the next level. I know a lot of you are, are doing job site meetings, doing interviews for new work virtually, and most of you are not doing it successfully. So we're going to talk about how to do that. And I, I really encourage everyone to join us for that as well. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. You have a good rest of your day. Be safe. Be healthy.